We've certainly discussed the idea of the slope of a demand curve several times before. Just as a refresher, if we have a demand curve as I've sketched here on the screen, then its slope is calculated as rise over run. The rise, if we start out here and end up here, it doesn't rise, it falls by 2 and the run is positive 1 because we're going from left to right and so the slope is negative 2. Often we're interested in asking how sensitive is quantity demanded to a change in price? In that case we're asking what is the change in x when you have a certain change in the price of x. Using the same initial and final points as I just did, the change in x when you go from the initial point to a final point is an increase of 1. The change in the price of x as you go from the initial point to a final point is a decrease in of 2. And so this is minus 1 half. Technically, this is the reciprocal of the slope. And what it reflects is how sensitive quantity demanded is to changes in price. So the farther away this number gets from 0, the more sensitive demand is to changes in price. And the closer it gets to zero, the less sensitive changes in demand are from changes in price. In most graphs in science, mathematics, engineering, and social science, the sensitivity of the effect when the cost changes is given by the slope of the graph. In economics, when we're talking about demand curves or supply curves, this sensitivity is given by the reciprocal of the slope. So, so this here is the sensitivity. Sensitivity of effect to changes in the cause. So if, if you had, as is usual in every other discipline, if you had cause on the horizontal axis and effect on the vertical axis and you had some graph, then the sensitivity would be equal to the slope. And in fact, in these situations, you don't you you go seamlessly between sensitivity and slope because they mean the same thing. But unfortunately, in economics, as we discussed before, with supply and demand curves, the cause is on the vertical axis, and the effect is on the horizontal axis. So it's all switched, and therefore the sensitivity isn't the slope. Instead the sensitivity is the reciprocal of the slope. So that's something of an awkwardness that comes about because Marshall decided to switch cause and effect. It's something to keep in mind. From now on, what I'm really interested in is measuring the sensitivity of effect to changes in the cause. There's a certain disadvantage in measuring it by the reciprocal of the slope. And that has to do with dimensions. Suppose that this is the this demand for apples. Then delta x would be pounds of apples. A pounds is abbreviated LB or LBS. A px in the US would be 
dollars per pound. And so the sensitivity And I'm always going to be talking about the sensitivity of effect the changes in the cost. I'll just call it the sensitivity. Measured as the reciprocal of the slope. So it's delta x over delta px has units of pounds divided by dollars per pound. And you can simplify this as follows. To get rid of the compound fraction, I'll write it this way, dollars per pound, and then multiply both numerator and denominator by pounds. Uh, pounds divided by pounds is equal to 1, so that doesn't change anything. The denominator then just simply becomes dollars because the pounds cancel, and the numerator becomes pounds squared. I should call this, well, it doesn't matter. So um, wh uh, whether you call it LB or LBS, it's the same thing. I was a little inconsistent, but that doesn't matter. You understand what I mean. Uh, this isn't a problem, except let's say you were trying to compare the sensitivity of demand for apples in the US and Mexico. In the US, this sensitivity measured as the reciprocal of the slope would have units of pounds squared over US dollars. In Mexico, the sensitivity would have units of kilograms squared divided by Mexican pesos. Now, it's trivial to convert pounds to kilos, but it's not trivial to convert dollars to pesos. You can use the, ex the foreign exchange rate, but the foreign exchange rate isn't the perfect measure of conversion because it's only based on tradable goods. You could use purchasing power parity. There are other ideas. If you take a class in international economics, you'll learn about this. And so we're getting into a whole other set of issues, which we would like to be able to avoid if all we want to know is whether US consumers or Mexican consumers are more sensitive to changes in the price of apples. So economists have a different way of measuring the sensitivity of effect to changes in the cause that is dimensionless. And that is called the elasticity of demand. It's written as the percent change in the quantity demanded of x divided by the percent change in the price of x. Now, I'm using a slightly more complicated notation than I did before. If I, I just stuck with the previous notation, then I'd write it this way, percent change in x divided by percent change in px. But I'm going to use the, the more, more uh, complicated notation what's in the numerator right now, uh, percent change in quantity demanded of x, because that'll help us keep some ideas that we're going to be learning about soon separate from the elasticity of demand. So you can compare the elasticity of demand formula to the reciprocal of the slope formula. And the difference is that in elasticity we're talking about percentages. Now there are different ways of expressing what this means. Here's one of the simplest ways. I won't write an equal to sign here. I'll write an approximately equal to sign because of things we'll talk about a little bit later. So the what I mean by the percent change in the quantity demanded of x is, for example, not exact, q2 minus q1 divided by q1. That's one way of expressing, one approximation of expressing the percent change in, in the quantity demanded of x, q1 here. And the percent change in the price of x, one abbreviation, one approximation, I'm sorry, for that is p2 minus p1 divided by p1. Let's look at the units here. In the US, the numerator has units of pounds divided by pounds, 
which cancel out. And the denominator has units of dollars per pound divided by dollars per pound, which cancel out. So this is dimensionless. And similarly, in Mexico, it's dimensionless too. You'd have kilos over kilos divided by uh, pesos per kilo over pesos per kilo. So both the numerator and denominator have units that cancel, and so the whole thing is dimensionless. Therefore, if I were to tell you that the elasticity of demand in the U.S. for apples is minus 1, and for in Mexico it's minus 2, you would immediately conclude that Mexicans are more sensitive to changes in the price of apples than Americans are, because their elasticity of demand being minus 2 is a lot farther away from 0 than Americans' elasticity of demand, which is minus 1. So that's the advantage of elasticity. One of the disadvantages of elasticity is that we only have approximations of how to calculate it. These approximations, uh, most of them, have the same numerators in the numerator and the denominator. It's the base, which is called, which is the what the denominators in the two places are called, that is arbitrary. So it would not be incorrect to put Q2 and P2 here instead of Q1 and P1. You're not going to get the same answer, but neither one of these is, is more right or wrong than the other. Indeed, you could also put the average of Q1 and Q2 in the f first denominator, so 1 half Q1 plus Q2, and the average of P1 and P2 in the second place. Now, what I just drew, what I just sketched was the what's called the arithmetic average, but that's not the only average that you could consider. You could also consider the geometric average, which is the square root of Q1 times Q2. Here's the square root of P1 times P2. And you can mix these up also. So there is no one best approximation for the elasticity of demand. There is a calculus precise definition for elasticity of demand. The most compact way of writing that is D L N Q D L N P, where L N is refers to the natural logarithms. Those of you who know calculus will see that this could be rewritten as one over Q D Q one over P D P. And if you simplify that, it's P over Q D Q by D P. I don't use calculus in the course, and the exam questions don't use it. So if you don't know calculus or don't know it well enough to understand what I just wrote, that's not a problem. But if you do know calculus, then this is the exact definition, which you can do if you know the precise functional form of the demand curve. And you can see here that it's going to be dimensionless because uh, the, the, uh, the, the units for P will cancel the units for dp, and the units for q will cancel the units for dq, and so you end up with a dimensionless quantity.